Okay, so these guys will be our uh, interns and YGTs. So if you'd like to ask how you can uh, have a position at EAC, perhaps, um, then direct your questions to these guys. Uh, we have Laura Dana, who heads up our caves expedition. On stage, please. <laughs> yes, yeah, we're all going together. Um, and uh, Serena is one of the astronaut trainers. Uh, she's a systems specialist on Columbus and is also a freshly certified Eurocom. So she talks to the crew in space. She's just come back from a week at the big control center in Munich. Um, and we have Susan who does a lot of the astronaut training as well and particularly HBP training, which is something that you might want to ask her about uh, together with Laura Dana. Um, Casey works, I'm not entirely sure what you do. He works. Uh, my name is Casey. I work in the medical office. We do everything from selecting new astronauts, keeping them healthy, supporting them in flight, rehabilitating them post flight, uh, and getting them ready and certified to fly again would be the short version. Cool, thanks. I was kidding, but thanks for that explanation. Um, we have Aiden, who runs a program here called Spaceship EAC uh, and works uh, in the top floor. And Alessandro, who does a bit of everything, but also does quite a bit of the CAVES program with Loredana. All right, so um, feel free to ask us anything at all. Uh, and I'm Eurocom, by the way, um, <laughs> also. So uh, together with Serena and some others, uh, we communicate to the crew in space. And uh, I do payload review and development for all the future European payloads. Question for the medical guys. Um, we know that there are deleterious effects of living in zero G or in microgravity. Um, and I think I'm right in saying there's been no experiments for long-term exposure to lunar, Martian, or lesser gravities. Um, do you have any intuitions, any thoughts about where the break points are between problem zero G and um, healthy living? Uh, that's a very good question. There are definitely various analog environments that try and simulate elements of living in different uh, space environments, but the gravity absence is a difficult one to, to uh, simulate. Uh, the upcoming one-year mission with uh, the, the two, uh, the astronaut and the cosmonaut, will be one of our first uh, opportunities to study in detail the effects of living without gravity for an entire year. The Russians have done it several times before. Um, this one will be, a, 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 I think, a much more scientifically rigorous approach to try and understand all the things that can happen uh, for being in space for a year. That would be probably the first opportunity we have to really look at in detail some of the physiological changes and what's needed uh, to be able to do something more uh, adventurous like going to Mars or spending even longer in, in a different gravity or partial gravity or gravity transition phases. Uh, lunar gravity probably will not be unhealthy. There's other issues like lunar dust that are the bigger issues that they're, they're concerned about. Hmm? Okay, um, and for a short pause before we go on to other questions, guys, uh, you get one minute to do a short intro of what you're working on at the moment at EAC. Okay, I'm Francesco um, from Italy. I uh, work on energy storage systems for a lunar base using 3D printed regolith. Hi, I'm Alberto from Spain, and I'm doing here an internship, and I'm working in and trying to um, to see how to store thermal energy using um, lunar regolith. Hi, I'm Kaylee. I'm from Ireland, and um, my background is science, but here I am interning in the video production lab. Hi, I'm Ulrike. I am from Cologne, and I'm a teacher, a science teacher. And I just created a model out of paper toilet rolls from the ISS for my students. <laughs> and I would really like to be, well, to come space more to schools because it's not taught much. And why, I wonder, it's our world. So let's, let's teach more about space, right? You can do it as well. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sylvia, I'm from Spain. I work with Kaylee in the video lab and we produce uh, divisible material for training. Hi, I'm Leo from the UK. I'm a young graduate trainee. Uh, I'm working on Spaceship EAC and uh, 
looking right now a few things, but mainly spending my time on simulations for a hydrogen fuel cell system for a moon base. Okay, okay. I'm Loredana Vestone. Uh, yeah, I work on the CASE program, of course, so taking people into caves, uh, well, astronauts usually, um, but I also take care of instructor training, uh, so training to become good at instructing and also behavioral training. So training flight controllers and people that come from, that will go to Concordia, Antarctica to get, to be good as teams in, uh, for a year in isolation. Hi, I'm Susan. I um, also work with Laura Dana on the astronaut training in the human behavior and performance. So as she said, we teach the flight controllers, the astronauts, and also the guys that go to Antarctica for a year on things like communication, teamwork, um, things like that, so. Hi, I'm Serena, I'm from Italy. My background is in astrophysics. I worked in research for 10 years before coming here. And right now, um, I assess crew instructor and I Eurocom. So I mostly do training for the crew, how to maintain the systems in Columbus, how to repair them if anything breaks. And as a Eurocom, I talk to them and I'll be in consult tomorrow morning. Hey guys, so it's me again. So you know what I'm doing for the NBF. Uh, I'm also supporting the NEMO mission since 2012. You have heard about that. Uh, beside that, I'm also Eurocom. Uh, I'm the instructor for the parabolic flight training of the astronauts. And I'm in charge of the aircraft piloting training program for the ast his astronauts also. So a lot of things to do, but it's fun. Hi, I'm Aidan. I'm uh, from Ireland as well. I'm a research fellow here, a scientist working on the spaceship EAC and also looking at future lunar exploration technologies, for example, 3D printing and energy storage uh, that we could potentially use in a lunar scenario in the future. Hello, uh, I am Alessandro, also from Italy, and uh, my background is aerospace engineering, and I work with Loredana on CAVES as operations engineer, and that has to do with the devices we bring in the CAVE and the operations documents we bring in the CAVE. All right, so any questions that you would like to uh, ask the crew, Remco? Um, of course, all kids want to be astronauts, as we know, but I guess the second best thing for kids to become is actually one of you guys. So, so let me ask one of the YGT graduates, like Leo, what does it take to uh, be considered or to get this highly desired YGT position at ESA? Uh, so you need a master's degree, uh, recently graduated, um, I don't think there's an age limit, um, and it's for early careers, so you don't need much experience. Um, I guess I, I did internships, which helped me a lot. Um, I, I studied aerospace engineering personally, but there's uh, YGT positions for even business, uh, law. Um, so it depends on your background, but things like internships help, obviously good marks for your education, um, doing stuff like Space Up, that would show your motivation. Um, yeah, this kind of thing. Awesome. Uh, Alex, question? Yeah, so um, to, Lu, uh, to you, Laura Dana, so how do you do the team training or the behavior training? Can you describe it a little bit? Uh, yes, we create stress. <laughs> We put people under stress, uh, you can see afterwards in the demonstration room, we have some of those examples, uh, like uh, computer simulations, uh, difficult situations, uh, we just create exercises, case studies, we try to create uh, difficult situation and then we get people to work on them and then we debrief. The key word is debriefing, yes. Hello, I have a question about real EVAs. If there is a problem in space and uh, an astronaut is not locked to the station anymore, have you a way to catch it, to catch him? Or is it a crisis like in gravity? Yeah, we try to avoid the gravity situation because it's, <laughs> because it's really gravity and, and, and it's really difficult. So uh, this is something that should not happen for different reasons because you have multiple layers of safeties. Uh, the first one is that you want to be double attached to the structure. So, for example, on the, on the NASA side, the astronaut is attached with a kind of safety line to the, to the airlock, and either his or her arm or a tether on another fixation point is attachment number two. So you should no, 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 never bring, break this rule. You should always be double attached. Then imagine, if we imagine that you are not double attached, 
you float away, you pull on your safety line, and you go back to the airlock. You have lost all the work that you have done uh, for the translation. Uh, it's a painful, it's, it's bad for the EVA, but at least you are safe. In case you are bro this line would be broken, then on the EMU suit, you have a kind of a small propulsion system, which is called the safer, that they can deploy. It's not as uh, fancy as the one that uh, the character of George Clooney have done in the movie, but it's, it's something that can bring you back to the station if you pilot it smart, there is enough autonomy for that. And this training is done in virtual reality. So this is something that uh, Loredana and myself, we have, we have done some years ago, uh, and, and you have to be careful, but you, you, can, you can come back. So you see different layers of safety, we, we try always to make sure that this is mission impossible to be lost in space. How many of us have seen gravity just out of interest? It was, it was good. It was a good movie. It's not every day you get to see your workplace blow up in space. Um, all right. Uh, we had another question. Uh, where's the mic? Yeah. Um, I have a question uh, and maybe also a suggestion on astronaut selection, um, particularly the 2009 selection. I think it's maybe a, a human behavioral or... I mean, we had to play a lot of games and, and were assessed. And my question is, has anything been done? Because you had a very, very large... Um, you know, statistically relevant group of, of, of motivated individuals that went through these things. But I've never heard of anything um, scientifically having been done with that, let's say, opportunity. And the suggestion would be that one aspect, as we heard, was a lot of uh, questionnaires. And I think the people that have participated have never been asked to follow up with questionnaires that could potentially have given you more data points for whatever psychologists are interested in. <laughs> so um, the general question is, has that opportunity been scientifically used? OK, so um, that's a very good question. I was the deputy manager for the selection campaign for the medical and the psychological components. And the, the very short answer to your question is that we're not allowed to use that data uh, specifically from ESA. However, it does exist. It, they're trying to look at ways to uh, enable some uh, methods to make the data uh, completely anonymous so that some of that can be researched. Um, the main institute that was uh, responsible for the psychological testing in the massive group of a thousand was the DLR Institute of Aviation uh, in Hamburg and they have that data but at the moment it's uh, considered not usable for scientific research from ESA and there's a just general discussion about is there a way to make that available. Uh, certainly they're very aware of the fact it's ripe with information and has a, a tremendous potential to be um, analyzed and studied but there are a lot of different reasons why it can't be used at the moment. Yes. I have another medical question for all the budding astronauts out there but what are the key medical factors that you look for in candidates? Uh, basically, you're trying very hard uh, to find someone who is overall fit in, in the general sense of well-being across the spectrum. So you're not looking for Arnold Schwarzenegger, you're not looking for marathon runners, you're looking for someone who is medically uh, as healthy as possible because the key component that we're looking at in a selection is risk mitigation. So you're trying to find the people that have the least likely scenarios to, that have a medical condition that would disqualify them or to develop a medical condition that would disqualify them in the future or cause a medical evacuation from the space station or a spacecraft. So uh, there's no uh, magic bullet that I can tell you. It's simply trying to be as healthy as you can, eating a good diet, exercising regularly, sleeping, minimizing your alcohol content, uh, trying to you know, engage in normal behavior that uh, across the board makes you a very healthy, well-rounded human being. So. I, everyone always asks, and I, I cannot give you the, this is the secret code on what you should do, but being a healthy person overall is, is the key factor. How much chocolate can we buy you to get extra points for the next astronaut selection? Uh, I'm easy. One bar is... Uh... <laughs> yeah. um, how much time do the astronauts spend training at the ESE because they do also training at NASA and, and JAXA. And maybe a second, second question is follow up. What do astronauts do after they uh, flew to space? 
So in EAC, they spend relatively a minor fraction of their time. They spend most of their time in the United States, in JSC, and in Moscow doing training about the larger side of the station. In EAC, they spend anything between two and six weeks, depending on the kind of training they get. So with us, for core systems, usually it's about two weeks. And then it's payload training, and until recently there was ATV training. Of course, that ATV finished, so we don't have ATV training anymore. So up to six weeks, I would say. And your second question was about post-flight. Yes, um, uh, what do astronauts do after they they went to the space station? Because normally they they don't have another flight coming up. Okay, I, I take it. Uh, well, f first of all, they they come back. They have a kind of uh, post rehabilitation phase where they are scrutinized and looked at from a medical perspective to look to look at how they recover. Then they are doing a lot of PR, even public relation. And uh, they have a lot of meetings, and, and they go everywhere to explain, uh, to share their, their mission. Then after six months of this period uh, of, of going around what we call the post-tour, let's say, uh, then they are back to the pre-assignment phase. So what was just mentioned before is applicable to assign astronauts to a specific mission, how much time they spend to EAC. The astronauts, the ESA astronauts who are back from flight, they are basically here. They have their office here and uh, they continue the pre-assignment. So pre-assignment is office work, you support some project, you do some emails, you do some PR event, you participate in additional training to maintain your training, capability, your, your training capa capabilities or eventually to get additional skills uh, in order to be ready for a future assignment. Uh, and then it's normal, normal office work. I think I, when the astronauts are selected, we train only European astronauts here for a couple of years. They are here all the time. Afterwards, before they're assigned to a mission, they do additional advanced training, pre-assignment training. And part of this assignment training is, for example, my case program. Part of the assignment training is some proficiency on EVA, uh, maintaining your robotic skills until you are assigned. Once you're assigned to a mission, then you spend most of your time traveling around, and here it's very short. But then we have all of the astronauts, all the European astronauts coming here. And then after that, yes, we go back to the pre-assignment training, because you're pretty much, again, pre-assignment, and you have to maintain your skills to get ready to be assigned again. So that is, again, taking you around, but mostly here in EAC again, for the European astronauts. The others, back to their home. Thanks. Yes. Um, a question for, uh, I'm not too sure, for maybe for everyone, but uh, how do you guys deal with your own sort of uh, maintaining your own uh, morale and enthusiasm when you see that, uh, you know, the, the level of support either uh, in the media or just uh, in government budgets for, for specified activity sometimes goes up, sometimes goes down, uh, on again, off again, we don't know what's happening in two years, we don't know what's happening in five years. How do you guys sort of, you know, keep yourselves motivated and coming into work each, each, each morning uh, to, to do your jobs. I'm going to pass that one to the interns first. What motivated you guys to still get into it as a potential? Can you pass it to Sylvie? Yep. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I just really like to come here and learn new things because my background, for example, is telecommunications and media. So I didn't know so much about space. And since I've been here, I've learned so much that I like to come here every day to learn more things. So I, I don't know, I don't really care if they invest more money or not, I just really like to be here. I feel, um, I feel the same and also I'm teaching and I'm teaching young persons there about 10 years old to 17, 16 years old maybe. And I think it's important that we um, spread this out to the world. We have a space station. It's like Star Trek, you know? We can motivate students to, to do more in science class. Sometimes they come from different environmental backgrounds and have maybe problems at home, problems in school, and then we can combine the everyday life with school and I think with space. And this is really great. And that's what I would like to do more in the future. Okay. Um, for me, it's coming from a science background, it's popular some years, popular not so much other years, so it's the same with space, and I just think having people who, who maintain 
their love for space will, will just continue to make it popular and continue to make it thrive, whether it's in the news or not. It doesn't really matter. Well, for me, it's kind of the same. Coming here every morning, it's just learning and trying to, to give some of my knowledge or it's basically train, um, learning, so I'm very motivated coming here every day. It's not like working, it's like, well, you work, but you enjoy work doing this. So you I don't, don't really work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, coming here every morning, it's nice because everyone is really into what he's doing here and really excited about the, the job and motivated. And I think we shouldn't care much about politics because, you know, politics changes really fast and people change their mind really fast. So we just keep doing what we do and we'll see what happens in the future. Thanks, Intense. That was awesome. Um, and be very, very grateful in Europe. I'm going to say this as a fake European. Um, I'm half Italian, half Australian, so I do get to fortunately come over and work here. In Australia, we don't really have a human space flight program uh, well, we don't have a human space flight program. It's written into our national space policy. We do not do human space flight or exploration or uh, launch systems. Um, that's hence why I moved away from the awesome weather to come over here. Um, so be very grateful in Europe. You have um, amazing national programs in pretty much every country. You've got the European Space Agency. You've got um, all of these amazing centres, the ISS control centres, and there's huge, um, incredible opportunities uh, in, in Europe, which, because you're inside it, you might not see them as quite so amazing, but from outside it is. So. Um, what's your recommendation? Sorry, also one more. Hold that thought. One more from Serena. So I'm one of the people on the difficult side of the contracts and I can tell you that, okay, that's something that you think about, but then what's important that you come here, you need to do training this morning and there is an astronaut in front of you that is, needs to fly to space. So he doesn't care about your contract, he wants to know what he needs to go to space. So you need to give him the motivation of why he has to do that, that task this morning, why it's important for him to be able to do it in space. and. You need to think about today. You need to think about this week, this week training, or maybe next week training because you need to develop something new. But if you think about the contract, you're not going to think about the quality of what you're doing today, which is important for the crew. Also, when you work as Eurocom, it's important that you support the astronaut when it's in space to do his job properly. So if he has a problem, so you need to think about, I'm going to, I need to give a good answer now. So the contract shouldn't enter in the work you do every day. At least this is my perspective. And I have to say, I've been here for 25 years. I came here six months after EAC was funded, and there is not one day that I've not been excited about my job. So I've heard it all about CAT, but I'm still here. <laughs> and uh, when we see your high interest and your uh, strong enthusiasm, I mean, it's almost impossible for us to lose the motivation. And sorry to cut off your question, please continue. Um, what's your recommendation for team building on Earth based on your experience with working with the astronauts? Susan? Yeah, sorry, who asked the question? Oh, sorry, it's really hard to see. So the question was team building on Earth. Was, what, how do we do it? Yeah, what's yeah. like the big learning? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like astronauts are on a unique situation. They are in a team and now it's like what are the essential rules they you have to apply or where you have to focus on to keep them motivated and to to run the thing is it like is it over over organizing the whole thing or is it like what's the magic behind a good astronaut and a good team okay so they um always have their team um work as part of our training, which Loredana said, we have lots of exercises. We obviously do teach them a bit of theory as well, if they want to look into it further. And then we actually put them in situations as well and then debrief them afterwards um, so they get to know more about their team. And last year, we also had the Chinese astronauts came for training for the first time. So having a look at, you know, even more cultural, um, different cultures in the team as well, which was really enlightening for all of them. And then after that, then they go and do a more... Um, realistic analogues such as caves, so maybe Laura Dana wants to talk about how they do team building in caves, but that's kind of what we do actually at EAC here. Well, the thing is uh, astronauts don't need a lot to be motivated. Um, 
and the place they go motivates them a lot. Um, we also train people that go to Antarctica and that motivates people a lot too. The only thing is that when you have to stay nine months with the same people, isolated, you can't go away and you have a dark environment, that starts to be more difficult. And the people that go to Antarctica don't have the same support that the astronauts have. So it's harder for us to train people that go to Antarctica to work effectively as a team than to <laughs> work with astronauts. But we can take something more and tell you something more when we're discussing next year. Yes, they, um, those guys, um, Susan and Loredana and Alessandro, uh, during the tour, they're gonna have a really awesome setup in the lecture halls. So you'll be able to ask them more detailed questions and they'll show you quite a bit more of that training. Ian. So I'd like to give a follow up on, the, uh, on this budget thing, but uh, how, so some of you are on Twitter and are quite active in like telling us or the, the public about uh, what, uh, what you are doing. So uh, are you aware that you just not doing a simple job but doing something very special that a lot of people are interested in, in what you are doing and what you are thinking about from the other, other perspective? And uh, is there a certain self-motivation in telling your own story and sharing your own story? Well, he wants to take that. I can start saying that I started Twittering because of Isa Caves. I wasn't Twittering before. It's hard because you have to do your job and Twitter at the same time. So you spend a lot of time in the evening. But it's very interesting to see that people actually love it. So it's not a motivation for me, uh, myself, because I'm motivated by my job. But I think it's a motivation for people to know more about the inside. So that motivates me to do it, even if it's a lot of work. Uh, to me, it's motivating to see that people like to know more of the inside. <clears throat> yeah, so I started to Twitter uh, in 2012 when I participated as support uh, to the NEMO 16 mission where uh, Timothy Pick, or his astronaut, was, was part of the crew. Uh, it was something brand new for me. I didn't know in which adventure I will go with this uh, tweeting, but uh, I got uh, catch, caught by it, and, and really, I, um, I, I'm, I'm really interested in, in sharing this uh, with you guys. I mean, it's, uh, it, I think it's part of our job. It's not to tell things about us, because uh, this is not about us, but this is just to share uh, something that is interesting for you. Uh, and we see, uh, depending on what we tweet or you react, and uh, what is more what you look for and what you don't look for. And this is a kind of, of sharing experience. We, it's part of our job also. Uh, I mentioned the taxpayer li li uh, previously, but we are, we are paid by, by the European taxpayers. You are part of these guys, and this is our duty to share our experience with you if you are interested to, in it. Uh, but as Loredana mentioned, it, it's something which requires time, you know. And uh, yes, we, have not pay we are not paid for that. Yeah, actually, well, only myself and Alessandro and Susan, aside from that, are, and no, Sylvia, you're on Twitter? No, no, sorry, and, and Leo is on Twitter. So, to be honest, more than half of us are not on Twitter. Uh, this is your task, possibly, for the next day and a half, is to show the rest of the team how to use it, and we can maybe uh, share a bit more of our personal insights from work. And was there another question? Yes, right yes. here. A uh, question for Selena. What is the strangest or most unexpected thing uh, an astronaut ever asked you or told you? <laughs> I don't know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the least unexpected, I can say for sure that, why do I need to do this? I don't have time, it, you know, it's boring. I will never have to do it. So you start to say, okay, but if you have to do it, you need to do because otherwise you will break something. Um, the most unexpected usually, which is not really related to training, is every time they hear, I'm an, ast I'm an astrophysicist, an astronomer, they start asking me things about astronomy because, of course, it's a way out of the training. So they start asking me about entropy, which uh, would take longer than a lesson to explain. So it's difficult to bring them back on track. Yeah. But usually the strange questions are physics related to the equipment we are using. So that's, that's actually the nice questions because I'm a physicist as well, so I can answer to those sometimes better than the engineering questions. 
Yes. I want to um, maybe zoom back to uh, when you guys presented yourself. We heard uh, lunar and energy and 3D printing a couple of times. And I really want to try to motivate you guys uh, because it's really cutting edge technology and the location, of course, and it's very much promising for the potential future of, of human spaceflight. So I hope that you realize that, you know, because of your hard work and hopefully breakthroughs, that you could pave the way for the future. And I just wanted us all to think about that and that hopefully from now on every day you kind of feel this responsibility a little bit. I mean, you know, if you guys are lucky or if you do your work hard, uh, you really can, uh, can help us all uh, into the future. So. Yeah, we hope so. Aiden. Uh, yeah, so I kind of manage the intern team that uh, works in that area. So thank you for that uh, vote of confidence. We're, we're all very motivated by this potential uh, technology and we see a lot of uh, really interesting spin-ins to human spaceflight. Uh, I personally hope 20, 30 years from now we'll be in a scenario where like Captain Picard and the Enterprise goes up, presses the button, asks for Earl Grey hot and out it comes, you know. That kind of iteration of technology is what I would like to see coming at the very end of, of, of all this work we're doing with 3D printing. So we're looking at it both from a production of structures for a lunar or a Martian environment, but also looking at a production of tools. So whatever tools astronauts could fabricate in orbit uh, using a 3D printer system. Uh, we're very interested in that technology and working on that here at the moment. Uh, just one thing to add, and uh, we're also even looking at 3D printing of food uh, so that you would be able to, uh, you know, push a button, get a pancake or something like that. But basically to, you know, how to put the nutrients in the right combinations and get something that's actually palatable to help with some of the logistics of just food. All right, we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Vim? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I have a question uh, actually about space logistics. Do you develop models here uh, for logistics in space? Cosmo. Ah, yes. Um, oh. Well, yeah, we have a position, not here. We have a position full time in the flight controlling team called Cosmo, which is an acronym that I forgot. Columbus Organization, I don't know, Google it, sorry. Columbus Storage, yes. What did you say? Columbus Operations Storage and Maintenance Officer. Yes, that's right. So yeah, Cosmo. Um, we, we talk in acronyms and they become words. So Cosmo is our, our full-time uh, person who is responsible for the whereabouts and of everything on board the station and the logistics of um, everything on the station. Uh, so yeah, they're based out of um, Oberpfaffenhofen near Munich in, the, in uh, Columbus Control Center. Yeah. And just to add something to that. Yes, we have people that are based in Torino and also with help from Bremen that take care of all the logistics. So they really start thinking about what to send to the space station, something like more than one year in advance. And so they plan every single item that needs to be shipped from Ziploc bags to big experiments and they decide on which cargo vehicles they go, what is the weight, what are the properties, how need, it needs to be packed, does it need thick foam, thin foam, does it need this kind of packaging rather than the other one and they take care of everything from really the packing to the delivery through customs, which sometimes is not so easy, to the delivery to Baikonur or JSC or wherever they need to send things. So it's a pretty big complex pro process. Yeah, and has to be done a lot more in advance than anything you would do, even in the most complex engineering operations on rigs or in underground mine sites, which is pretty extreme. You know, if you're desperate, you can get anything from anywhere in the world in, you know, under 24 hours uh, to space. We have to plan our maintenance schedule way more in advance because um, you don't really have that option. And just to give you a, a typical example, the, the clothes for the crews are usually ready at least six months in advance before the crew actually is in space sometimes. So it takes a long time to plan. I had a question about food in space because you mentioned 3D printing and uh, recently they put the experiment up there, the veggie thing, where they could grow some plants. Last thing I heard, they were not supposed to eat them yet, but uh, is there any plans to continue in that and also the training for the astronauts? Do they need to study gardening or something around those lines? Yeah. 
So I know there have been experiments in space using plants. One of them was executed, I think, a couple of months ago at the latest. I'm not aware of anything they have eaten so far. But yes, they do experiments all the time. So one of them was in Columbus, really, just a couple of months ago. And in the GEM laboratory, the Japanese lab, they also have other experiments on plants. Is there any plants, uh, like, do they need to train gardening? Uh in that respect, is that in the training, also recognizing edible food, uh, see whether it's as growing? As far as I know, we haven't done anything here. Everything was done at NASA. Okay. Uh, we're actually looking at starting a project in the not too distant future, looking at the production of uh, tomato plants, um, growing them with a new type of uh, uh, system, which will simulate lunar type conditions. So we're, we're going to host that experiment here at EAC. So that could be a potential starting point for some training activities around that. All right, we have time for one more question, and if there is anything else before we uh, show you something and then head to lunch. Um, yep, Suzanne. I'm quite interested in uh, 3D printing, and you're just saying, well, we are working on it, but could you um, say a little bit more about it? Because I only know these small 3D printers, and I don't see a whole lunar base from this uh, small uh, 3D printer. Speak a little bit slower, Aiden. Okay. Um, yeah, so at the moment, you're quite correct. The, the first generation technology is using thermoplastics, which is what you see in the stores at the moment, the, the basic MakerBot type uh, 3D printers. Um, we're interested in involving that technology. Um, at the moment, there is a 3D printer on the space station. Um, so they've used it for, for, it's made by a company uh, who works with NASA called Made in Space. So they're looking at how they can use this 3D printed thermoplastics for on-orbit applications. We're very interested in that as well. Um, they're already talking about a follow-up mission to that, a uh, follow-up experiment to a more advanced printer that can print metals and thermoplastics. So you'll have a, a, a new spectrum of materials you can use. And that, that increases the amount of potential tools you can produce now in orbit. And very interesting as well, you could potentially start recycling that material back into the loop. So rather than just bringing up a tool every six months, uh, as, as was discussed, the, the logistics behind this is quite difficult. You can just send up a, a, a model file to your 3D printer and print it off on orbit. Use it for your uh, task and then recycle it back into your, your feedstock material. So that way you don't have to keep bringing up uh, tools. From, it reduces the logistical supply here uh, from our side. For the larger type structures like uh, printing on the moon, we're looking at using things like concentrated solar light. Uh, so you have 14 days of sunlight on the moon and 14 days of, of darkness. During that sun, sunlight period, you could essentially focus the, uh, the solar light onto the regolith and sinter it into, into shapes. So you can start building up bricks uh, using a 3D type uh, printing methodology. Uh, you can also use microwaving as well in a similar technique and um, to essentially sinter the, the regolith. It's a quite interesting material. It's got very unique properties and uh, we're interested in exploring the possibilities of what we can do with it here at EAC. Awesome, yes. So, we're going to finish up here, um, and you are able to uh, chat to us over lunch and for the rest of the day. And if you notice this morning, uh, at the exact moment that Space Up opened, uh, we had a special greeting direct from the International Space Station. This is from Samantha. They do have internet on board the station since 2011. It's a bit like dial-up speed, but it's, there's internet. And, uh, and Sam sent us a special greeting, so... And because you work here and you won't get ex as excited about it as the rest of us, it's from space! <laughs> All right, so we are going to finish up now. Um, all of the, the staff at EAC, uh, like I said, the tweeters amongst us is Alessandro, um, Hervé, um, Loredana with the ESA Caves account, Leo uh, and myself. Everybody else, you have a task to convince them. Uh, through the weekend. Um, we are going to head off to lunch in a minute. Uh, you have an hour for lunch to chill, chat. Um, all the food will be served in the coffee area where you, we were before. Um, and then we'll meet back here at uh, about one o'clock. Um, yes, enjoy.